Hi, I'm Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network. Now we're called the Sacred Inclusion Network. And for those of us that are not aware, those of you that are not aware of us, um, we honor the sacred in all of its forms. And we're true to our roots as a diversity and spirituality network. We're very passionate about exploring the intersection of uh, what some people call diversity and spirituality. And you can find more about us by going to our website, sacredinclusion.com. And today it's my enormous privilege to interview Bob Boister, who's a president and CEO of the Fetzer Institute. And the Fetzer Institute, I believe earlier this summer or, or, or sometime earlier this year, they came out with a, with a study that's called What Does Spirituality Mean to Us? Which essentially is a study of spirituality in the United States, which is a subject that I'm very, very passionate about. And um, welcome, Bob. Um, happy Thank to be talking you, with you. Pleasure to be here. So, Bob, before we started getting into the data, um, I, I, I would like to have you introduce yourself, kind of, if you answered some of those questions that are in the, in the survey, how would you situate yourself? Well, uh, I'm also passionate about spirituality and the spiritual dimension of life, uh, and really have been. Uh, I had the, uh, for a long time, I had the blessing of being born into uh, a family of faith, a community of faith, uh, and uh, absorbed, I think, at a very early age, the, the idea that life is sacred, uh, that uh, we, each of us is sacred, uh, and that we're here uh, to love. And so I have to say, uh, I love the name Sacred Inclusion Network because it affirms the sacredness of all things and uh, our connection and need to be in relationship. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is more about you than me, but uh, the inclusion part is a very important part in this in this particular polarized world that we're living in right now, you know. Um, and I, I'll just jump in right there. Uh, uh, I have a, a friend, uh, John Powell, who... Uh, yeah, I know of John's work, yeah. That leads the, uh, he founded and leads the uh, Othering and Belonging yes. Institute at uh, the University of California, Berkeley. And one of the things I've really gotten from John is uh, the distinction he draws between inclusion and belonging, where uh, he suggests that uh, inclusion is a situation where somebody has been outside the circle and we invite them in, but we invite them in to be part of a community that all is already there uh, mm -hmm. versus his vision of belonging, which is to uh, invite everybody in and then co-create together something oh. new that reflects our shared values and commitment. Uh, and uh, I'll say we've used the word inclusion at Fetzer. In fact, our, our four core values are love, trust, authenticity, and inclusion. And we're uh, engaged in a intensive diversity, equity, and inclusion effort right now. Uh, but as I reflect uh, on John's comments, uh, I, I hope our aspiration is belonging in yeah. that deepest sense. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that. I love that discrimination because um, basically, to use his language, um, inclusion sounds like we have this thing that we're going to let you join it. But belonging is more like we're not really sure what we are, but we'd like to have you help co-create it and, and have a definition. Exactly. exactly. That is a wonderful, you know, before I should get, I should get started by um, get, getting you to tell me a little bit about the Fetzer Institute and what your mission is and why you wanted to do this survey. Yeah, uh, our mission statement is helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. So it's a statement that lifts up the spiritual dimension of life and love. And the reason those are our two focal points are that we feel like love is the only human impulse that's strong enough to overcome all of the things that are fracturing our world, pulling us apart, pulling us down. Uh, and we think that the challenge of opening our hearts in love is, is best understood as a, a, a spiritual challenge. Uh, so uh, from there we go uh, uh, to a, a more concrete goal statement that talks about inspiring and supporting broad-scale spiritually grounded transformation from an ego-centered way of being to an all-centered way of being mm -hmm. with the result that uh, we embrace love 
as the basis for living in sacred relationship with spirit, ourselves, other people, and the natural world. So uh, we, we've planted our flag uh, uh, on the, uh, in, in favor of love, in favor of uh, the sacredness of reality, the importance of spirituality. Uh, and a lot of our program work is actively uh, advancing those goals. But we have a long history of commitment to, to research where we say to work effectively in the world, we need to understand the world. So we need in some sense to lay aside our, our own commitments uh, and in a neutral way uh, probe uh, these key questions. In this case, uh, uh, the role of spirituality in American life. Um, and so uh, this, this study that you've encountered reflects that, that research dimension of our work. You know, the word spiritual is so interesting. You know, um, if you look in Wikipedia, and so is the word religion for that, for that matter. Um, but it means so many different things to a lot of different people. And um, one of the things that your study seemed to do was to fill in the blanks a little bit and to talk about how different people perceived it differently, as opposed to just trying to um, kind of enforce a kind of uniform definition on it. But I, yeah. I suppose a good place to start is uh, when you asked, uh, when you do all these focus groups, um, how would you summarize how people saw um, what spirituality meant? Well, as you say, diversity is uh, one of the important characteristics. Uh, in terms of the headlines of what we found, we found that spirituality is pervasive, uh, uh, well over half, I think about uh, three quarters uh, of the respondents uh, said that spirituality is either very important to them or somewhat important. And then as we probe more deeply in terms of what that translates to in terms of spiritual practice belonging to spiritual community, uh, we found that uh, it, it's not just important in the abstract, it manifests in these very real ways. Uh, but one of the uh, things we tried to do in this study was not pre-impose on the study some uh, pre-existing understanding of spirituality, but rather ask open-ended questions and uh, use other methodologies that invited the respondents to share what, how they understood spirituality. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was wonderful and rich uh, and, and highly varied, although there were some, some themes that emerged. One of the, the powerful themes was the theme of connection, mm -hmm. uh, that spirituality was somehow about connecting to someone or something bigger than ourselves. Uh, and that came up as connection to a higher power, but it also came up as connection to other people and connection to the natural world. And uh, different people emphasized uh, different dimensions of connect connectivity, uh, but uh, a, a common uh, result seemed to be that it was a connectivity that pulled them out of themselves and away from beyond their immediate self-regarding concerns toward a sense of connection and concern for uh, the larger world. You know, I think the word religion is even more challenging to me. A spiritual, it's almost, we, it's, it's okay if that's a little bit amorphous, all right? So we can, we can, because it's individual. Um, but, you know, I have like, for example, I have a friend who's a humanist. He's a, a secular humanist. And when I look at him, to me, he's just as religious as anybody else. To me, humanism is just another religion. Now, he would, he would challenge me on that. But, um, uh, so anyway, uh, I was wondering, because you know, when, when I read your study, and I read it several times, I, I, I still left a little mystified as to what people meant by it. But in general, they seem to be talking about the organizational aspect of, um, of things, let's say. Uh, what, what is your take? And, and what do you think your takes of your, of your uh, participants were? I think you're right. I think that uh, institutional affiliation is certainly a dominant dimension of what people seem to understand when you ask them, you know, are you very religious, somewhat religious? So uh, the, the idea of 
a strong identification with and for many uh, regular participation in uh, a religious congregation within one of the recognized uh, religious traditions, denominations. Uh, and so there was, I think, uh, in some sense, a distinction between religion being more about organizational affiliation, spirituality being more about our interpersonal experiences of that something more. And some people put, put, the, put, put the things together. Um, they didn't see a, a big separation between the two. And you had no, other people that uh, made, had a big separation for them. Yeah, you know, the majority of people uh, identified as both religious and spiritual. And I think uh, one way I think about that is that at the heart of all of our, quote, religions, uh, our spirit, is that intense transformative personal experience of the transcendent reality. Uh, but then uh, part of uh, the development of the tradition is the creation of doctrine, structure, organization. Uh, but for the religion to stay alive and life affirming, I think the participants need to have to regularly go back to that well of transformative personal spiritual encounters. So uh, I, I would certainly hope that spirituality is alive and well within all of the religious traditions. But what this survey underscores is it's also alive and well outside the traditions. Yeah, and it's interesting. It's it, when the spirituality piece seems to die, and I'm kind of reading into your your study and others. Um, for a lot of people, the 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 religion dies. So you have a number of people that have um, when they they grew up into a particular religious tradition and they left it. And I imagine if you ask them, um, they may, maybe they wouldn't define it quite pre that precisely. But I believe they didn't find that that meaning in there. The dogma didn't make 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 sense, and they they went in search of another direction. No, I, th I think that's right. And uh, so I think one of the things we think about at Fetzer is how we can support the leaders within uh, religious traditions who are uh, working to renew, uh, to, to rekindle that, that, it, that, spirit, that transformative spiritual flame that it really is at the, the living heart of all the religions. But, you know, we see... Uh, often uh, in the news, religion showing up in a very different and darker way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of people have been uh, on the wrong end of that and therefore have uh, taken a big step back from religion. But, but that's not to say that the religious traditions have lost their their spiritual core. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, there's an old expression that uh, in the Christian tradition, the church is always in need of reform mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and renewal. And so uh, I, th I think uh, for people who uh, are on spiritual paths within the traditions, that's a, that's a wonderful calling to be part of constantly rekindling the mm -hmm. spiritual flame within the tradition. Uh, and of course, many people are now on paths outside of traditions, uh, often drawing on multiple traditions for inspiration and, and practice. Uh, and that's important work too. Uh, and uh, we think a lot about uh, how those paths can converge in a shared affirmation of the sacredness of, of reality. Uh, and uh, so we talk a lot about the shared sacred story of the human family. One of the things you said that was interesting just now is um, how people sometimes go outside of their tradition to sort of find themselves. You know, and I think a lot of it is sort of aided by technology. Um, when I grew up, um, you know, if I went to a particular church, um, that was pretty much the only, that was the only, that was the only, that was the only thing in town, right? Nowadays, I could just go on the internet. If there's some perhaps hobby that I have, I can shop around and maybe I can bring it back to my tradition if my tradition is open or I could just go in a different direction. That wasn't the case as 50 years ago or even 40 years ago, I don't think. No, that's, that's certainly true. Uh, we now, and it's very recent, uh, live in a world where we have access to the spiritual riches of all of the traditions. Uh, and you know, many people are, as I said, drawing on 
resources across traditions. Now there's another point of view that says, well, that's, that, that's good, but uh, if you do that to the ex exclusion of going deep within a single tradition, uh, you may not get as far in your spiritual journey. Uh, so uh, the, uh, at Fetzer, uh, we're a, a, a spiritually diverse community. We have a staff of about 60, uh, and uh, we, uh, we describe ourselves as an inclusive, spiritually grounded community of love and hope. But it, it raises the question of uh, what is our spiritual common ground? Is there a spiritual common ground? And how do we strengthen and deepen it? And, and the uh, uh, conclusion we've come to uh, over the years is that, yes, there, there is strong spiritual common ground and, and learning how to name that and deepen that is crucially important. But it's also important to recognize we get to that common ground on very different paths. And so uh, a, another key challenge and their integrity related is uh, honoring that difference and learning how to uh, be in relation in supportive relationships so we support each other in going deeper on the various paths paths each of us has committed to and I think that in in microcosm uh, is uh, the problem that the human family faces uh, in macrocosm now you know um, your study is one of several different studies that have looked looked at religious life. Um, and others, predecessor studies by, the, by Pew, by, the, by other organizations, uh, they all talk about how, how things have changed over time. And uh, I, I'm curious as to what your study told, told us about that, if anything, you know. Um, I alluded to my childhood, for example, and how things have changed. Um, when I look at um, Pew research, it seems that there's less denominational people that there were. So a lot of them, they're still the majority, but it's like less and less. Um, so what, is, what does your study have to say about that, Bob? Well, the first thing I'll say is it was not a, a longitudinal study. So we were looking at, you know, the state of spirituality in America at a particular point in time, you know, late 2019, early. So I'll ask, you, I'll ask you the broader question. Okay. Then. But, but, but notwithstanding that, there are some things that the study, uh, I think, reveals that, that bear on your question. Uh, for me, the most interesting was that uh, the respondents reported broadly that they had become more spiritual as they got older. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, very interesting. And there's some, there's, uh, I find that very positive that as people engage these spiritual questions, uh, they realize over time how important they are uh, and how life affirming it is. To, to commit to uh, engage those questions. Uh, now, it was also true that uh, when we uh, asked the people who identified as spiritual but not religious, uh, I think about half of them had uh, earlier in their lives a uh, explicit religious identification. Mm -hmm. So you can infer that uh, for that group, uh, there was a significant stepping back to, to uh, uh, a broader spiritual identification, but not a religious identification. And that, that of course, fits with uh, the data from Pew and others. Um, I'll take that as the opportunity to say that uh, this is a very rich data set that we are making publicly available to researchers uh, for deeper second level analysis. We did not do the age cohort analysis as part of the first study, but I think that's a, an obvious uh, next study is to look at how, how this picture varies uh, by age cohort. One of the things I found interesting um, about your study is that when you, when you brought the people back to focus groups after they had some baseline, a lot of them changed their point of view. So you might've had somebody that was, um, describe themselves as not religious or not spiritual after they gone through the questions, we said, well, maybe I am, <laughs> yeah. maybe I am spiritual. <laughs> yeah, there were two points where that really manifested. One is the one you just mentioned, that 
as people listened to other people talk about spirituality, they said, well, if that's what it is, I'm spiritual. <laughs> Come in. <laughs> uh, and then the second point where that same uh, dynamic uh, surfaced was around the question of, uh, is, do you feel like there's a connection between your spirituality and your civic engagement? And there again, uh, there were a significant number of people whose initial response was no, there's no connection, who as they listened to others uh, talk about that connection uh, and reflected on their own lives, they realized, yeah, yeah, the way I am engaging the outside world really is significantly affected by these core spiritual experiences and beliefs. Now, another thing I wanted to ask you, and you alluded to it a little bit, at least you mentioned it, there's this category that's become kind of sexy in this kind of genre that we're talking about, which is this designation of people that are spiritual but not religious. Um, and um, a lot of people have done a lot of thought, thought about that, and they come to um, not always the same conclusions about them. Um, but I, I, I'm just curious as to what your thought is about this group, and I can ask you some follow-up questions once I can understand where you're coming from with that. Yeah, well, I think where I'm coming from is the proposition that uh, as we define spiritual, uh, we are all spiritual beings. Uh, and let me unpack that. Uh, my uh, operational definition of the spiritual dimension of human existence is that dimension where we grapple with the deepest questions. Uh, you know, what is the nature of reality? Is there any purpose to this, any meaning, either at the macro level or the level of my own life? Are there objective moral principles that are embedded in the fabric of reality, or do we all just make it up as we go? Uh, and uh, nobody gets a free pass on those questions. Uh, we all engage them and either explicitly or implicitly put down our bet, and that bet that we put down profoundly shapes the way we engage life. Uh, so uh, when somebody steps back from a explicit religious commitment community or is born outside one, uh, they, they are still you know, spiritual beings in the sense I've just described. Uh, and uh, a perfect example, we have uh, as another part of our research work, uh, supported research uh, by an organization that's now called the Sacred Design Lab. Oh, I know them. I, I was going to I was going to allude to some of their some of their they studies have, earlier studies. They yeah. have done some amazing field work around the spiritual lives of millennials and younger generations, uh, and of course, the Pew data will will say that uh, a a large component of those age cohorts uh, does not identify as religious. Uh, but what the, their research found was that the spiritual questing is alive and well. Uh, and the, the, ar around the human need for meaning, purpose, and belonging. And that there's actually huge spiritual innovation in that those younger age cohorts uh, evolving new forms of spiritual community and spiritual practice uh, to address those fundamental eternal human needs for meaning, purpose, belonging. Yeah, I, I interviewed, um, I, I'm not remembering his name now, um, one of the people in the Sacred Design Lab. Casper, um, probably Casper. Yeah, Casper. yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and um, I found his like 18 page PDF um, revelatory. And uh, basically what it said is that, um, yes, they're, these people are, these millennials are not so denominational, but they've, they've, they're looking for meaning in kind of secular context. So he would use uh, examples like, um, oh, I don't know. Um, I can't remember the name of the group now. Um, so in other words, he would look at a group of people who um, do fitness kind of activities. And he would find some of the same trappings that would be present in a, a congregational settings are now present in the secular. And uh, it was very artful in how he, d he drew, a, drew a connection between some of the predecessor organizations of an older generation yeah. and some of the sort of like secular containers of um, meaning, meaning making, yeah. I, I guess I'll call it. Yeah, I think the uh, fitness organization you're thinking of might be CrossFit. 
I think they uh, yes yes I am but, I'm right I couldn't remember uh, their names <laughs> and, and the the interesting thing uh, I strongly encourage anybody that's interested to go to their website Sacred Design Lab I think dot org and uh, look at these reports but they developed uh, a six uh, dimensional uh, framework that said these are the six major functions that faith communities have traditionally performed. Let's look outside traditional faith communities and see what organizations are performing some, most, all of those functions. Uh, and then let's, let's study them. And, and as I said, they found a lot of what you might call secular spiritual inner innovation. Uh, and interestingly, they took the next step and, and brought those uh, spiritual innovators, the leaders of those groups, together with... Uh, uh, young innovators within the faith traditions, the people that were, as I said, trying to renew the flame of their own tradition. And they found huge, huge commonality uh, uh, and, and, and an immediate bond across those two groups because they are working the same problem, mm -hmm. uh, these deep questions of meaning and belonging. Yeah, one of the subgroups that came out of this work, um, I don't know if it's directly or not, but it's a group called Nuns and Nuns. And what that group does is that they bring together nuns, actual NUNs, with people that would, if you give them a demographic study and say, what are you, they'll, they'll, quack, they'll quack none. And they tend to be younger, at least in this cohort. And there's a lot that the group, that, that each of them have to tell one another. It's, it's just, just beautiful. I, I'd like to investigate that more. But when you think about it, so if you didn't grow up in a church, um, you don't necessarily have this kind of feeling of community that people that are church bound do. I don't church bound, that's, that's pejorative. I don't mean it. So there's something that's wonderful about community. And anyway, so there's like a, a great rich synergy between these two groups, which I found fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. No, there, there really is. And uh, this goes back to the everybody's a spiritual being. You know, I found some wonderful language on your uh, Sacred Inclusion Network uh, webpage when you described yourself uh, or your, your organization as uh, committed to the proposition that there's something beyond uh, ma material reality that pulls us you know, that, uh, into connection. Or, uh, and uh, we use very, very similar language at Fetzer uh, back to this articulation of our spiritual common ground, the language we use is we are drawn into community by our experience that there's more to reality than physical reality. Mm -hmm. And that that quote, something more uh, binds us in a deeply interconnected, purposeful and sacred reality and calls us to a life of love. Uh, and, you know, our lived experience is that uh, as human beings, we are, uh, we're born into this mystery of existence with this sense that there is this something more and with a longing to connect to that something more. Uh, and that uh, that's just fundamental. As we say in the study, uh, human beings are spiritual beings. Mm. Now, I, I haven't gone into the, the weeds. I mean, I read the report, but I haven't read the, you know, the the actual data, um, but I guess we're living in a very polarized time. And uh, I would imagine there were people on all, both sides of the political fence that they came into your study and probably they had lots of different commonalities. But I was wondering if you, you have any reflections as to maybe the differences in terms of how these people, how different, different um, I call them partisan groups, um, uh, view, view spirituality or religion, maybe through the lens of your study or maybe just in general. Well, um, again, this is a, a second order question that we didn't address directly in the study. Uh, we did look at the connection between uh, spirituality and civic engagement, uh, but not at the level of partisan identification, rather at the level of what's the impact of uh, spirituality on uh, whether an individual engages in a pro-social way in their communities. Uh, and there we found a very strong connection. Uh, but again, this is a, uh, an area where we invite researchers 
to take this down to the next level. And in fact, there is a brief article that was published uh, recently in the religious, Religion News Service uh, that, that tried to take it down, to, that did take the analysis down to this next level. Uh, and uh, they found uh, both commonalities and, and differences. Uh, in, uh, they found a somewhat greater percentage of people who identified as strong Republicans expressing a sense of connection to a higher power uh, and a somewhat stronger uh, sense that their uh, spiritual and religious commitments shape their worldview and therefore their politics. Uh, but the differences- it Wasn't that stark. Wasn't that stark. And I'd like to, I'd go back to your observation about uh, polarization. And uh, we do a lot of work. One of our major initiatives is an initiative we call Healing the Heart of American Democracy, uh, where our starting point is uh, the uh, somber assessment that we have on both sides gotten so good at dehumanizing and ultimately demonizing the people on the other side that uh, in some sense, our ideological differences have become secondary. That, that dehumanization and demonization uh, is ripping our free society apart uh, and that uh, the presenting challenge is not should government be bigger or smaller. Uh, we can't even get there because we have lost our ability to be in relationship uh, and to engage in, in, in common action. And uh, there, I think spirituality, well, there this study indicates that spirituality is a, a tremendous positive resource because when we ask uh, people to character, respondents to characterize uh, spiritual persons and the, the attributes they associate with spirituality. Uh, what came up was precisely the attributes uh, that we need to, to heal our democracy, uh, empathy, compassion, understanding, humility. Uh, so uh, one thing we do want to lift up is the importance of spirituality is a resource to overcome polarization. One of the things your, your study talked about is different ways people, people practiced spirituality um, or religion. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, to, uh, first off, they do practice. Uh, the, the majority of people reported or respondents reported that they uh, engaged in what they defined as a spiritual or religious practice at least once a week. Uh, and uh, when you unpacked that, uh, prayer was the single most in, uh, common practice with over half of the uh, uh, respondents saying, uh, I pray regularly. Uh, but beyond that, uh, some of the more common practices, uh, reading, uh, meditation, time in nature, uh, art, uh, so, uh, I guess a commonality of practices that create space for deep inner reflection and uh, deep connection with that something more. You know, I think one of the challenges today, and uh, we, 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 you and I have talked about this just um, sort of um, tangentially, is um, it, it's, a, it's becoming an increasingly secular society. That's just how it is. But as you, as you indicated, that doesn't mean that people aren't spiritual within that sort of context. So I don't know if this is something that your study addressed uh, or if it's something you may maybe have some thoughts in general. Um, but these things which we identify with spirituality, particularly uh, what you uh, identify as connection and compassion and love and all these kind of things, uh, the need for those doesn't go away in a secular context. So I guess the question is, how can we... Um, how can we apply um, these kind of uh, virtues, like I could say, how, how does this fit into a secular, secular, a secular lens? That's a broad question and uh, it's yeah. fair and to ask it, you, but I'll ask you anyway. That, one that we reflect on uh, uh, deeply uh, and on which we have a strong point of view. Mm. Uh, and uh, that is uh, to push back against 
some of the deep assumptions of secular culture. And here I'll distinguish between pluralistic uh, and secular. I'll come back to that. But uh, in, in shorthand, what I would say is that you know, we live in a culture that has been shaped by the Enlightenment experiment and, and the post-Enlightenment experiment, which was essentially a secular experiment. It was an experiment that was undertaken uh, to overcome the, the dark side of religion and the religious wars of several centuries ago. Uh, so it took a huge step back from this spiritual way of engaging reality and instead emphasized reason and science. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's been, from a certain perspective, tremendously beneficial to humanity. Uh, you know, out of those commitments, uh, our understanding of the material world uh, has grown profoundly. And out of that understanding has come technology of all sorts that have uh, benefited humanity greatly. Uh, so we celebrate that. Uh, but we also say that perhaps we should reflect on the dark side of that step back from engaging the spiritual dimensions of life. Uh, that uh, uh, one way to put it is that uh, we think there was a, a, a nihilistic pull uh, embedded in those core enlightenment assumptions from the start in the sense that uh, the enlightenment, uh, if you will, put reality on the operating table and dissected it. Uh, and from that process of dissection, we, we understand how the body is put together, but in the process, we killed the soul. Uh, and so we would say the fundamental challenge is not how to do spirituality in a secular context, but how through our spirituality to recover a sense of the fundamental sacredness of everything uh, and to... Uh, to reject the materialistic understanding uh, of reality that's emerged from the Enlightenment experiment that says it's atoms and molecules all the way down. You know, there's nothing more to existence than that. So there is no meaning inherent, no, no values inherent in reality. Uh, we reject that. Uh, and we stand with all of the great traditions who have, have come back from their now millennia long effort to, to probe the fundamental mystery of existence and, and said in their own ways, it's sacred. And the only appropriate response is reverence and love. Uh, and so, you know, our big emphasis is to say, let's, let's recover that shared sacred story of existence for the human family in a way that, going back to what I said before, celebrates the fact that we get to that deep commonality on this rich diversity of paths. And so there's a lot we can learn from each other, but the headline is not our difference, but our deep convergence on the sacredness of reality and the rightness of love. Mm. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's, that's beautifully put. You know, I guess the only other thing I could, that I, I want to ask you, and you can obviously you can talk about things which I didn't ask you, but um, you, you talked about this a little bit, this um, sort of convergence of people that said that they wanted to be more spiritual and um, some sort of social engagement. Um, and there seemed to be a correlation between the two um, among the people that, um, that were in your, your survey or study, I want to call it. Um, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, well, the correlation was there, it was strong. And when you ask people about it, um, I think two themes emerged, the theme of deep connection and the theme of accountability. Uh, as I said before, a cross-cutting theme of what spirit, the spirituality meant to people was around this theme of connection to a higher power, to other people, uh, to the natural world in, in whatever combination. Uh, and, and that connection was not just a, 
a physical connection. It was a connection of moral significance. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with that connection came a sense of responsibility and accountability. Uh, I think most strongly uh, for those who uh, experience a connection with a higher power, a sense of accountability to that power for how they live their lives. But it was, it was also there for people whose sense of, of connection was to humanity, to the natural world. Uh, and so it was a spirituality that uh, had a moral imperative to care embedded in it. Now, we've been talking about American spirituality. I'm wondering, um, just your observations, I know that you're not a professional in this, but um, you know, we're different to some extent than Europeans and Asians and all that, and Africans for that matter. Um, I guess the question would be, what do you think is unique about the American experience of spirituality and for that matter, religion? Well, I'll say first, I'm not an expert on this. So I'm, okay. not, I'm not sure how much stock you could put in what I'm about to say. Uh, but uh, I'll invoke uh, others far wiser than me, but going back to uh, people like Alexis de Tocqueville, who came over to study the American experiment back in the 1830s and 40s, and immediately remarked on what a powerful presence religion was in American life relative to what he had experienced in, in Europe. Uh, and so he put a tremendous focus on uh, what happens within our faith communities and the moral commitments that are grounded in our faith. Um, and uh, I think that has been uh, remarkably durable over time. True today uh, as it was then. Yeah, uh, Robert Bell's uh, recent study of the role of faith in American life, uh, again, reached conclusions uh, very much along the same lines as de Tocqueville, that for whatever reason, uh, religion has found and, and faith has found fertile soil here in America. Uh, and it, uh, uh, but we're not unique in that. I mean, we, we, we are, uh, I think we stand in contrast to uh, uh, secular European cultures, uh, although spirituality is becoming more significant uh, for the Europeans, in part because of their growing Muslim population mm. and deal with uh, religious spirituality. Uh, but when you look beyond uh, uh, North America and, uh, and Europe, uh, what you see is uh, tremendous growth in faith traditions around the world, whether it's in Asia or Africa or South America. So uh, to some extent, uh, we Americans, uh, and particularly, I would say, more secular American elites on the left, uh, are at risk of underestimating mm. the importance of spirituality and religion uh, uh, on on the global scale. Oh, that's that's a, that's a very good point. You know, I see this uh, eastern 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 coast un- elites. Like I suppose I can consider myself. We can sort of like look down upon uh, people in the Midwest, or for that matter, people all over the world that have this faith is living for them. And it, it may be in a denominational context, it may be not. Um, I don't mean to wax too, too along about this, but the rise in new religious movements is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just an American phenomenon. It's particularly true in, America, in, excuse me, in Asia and in Africa, uh, for example. And so these are, these are people not running from faith, they're, they're moving towards it. Yeah. And, so I asked you a lot. I probably didn't ask you as much as I probably should have about the survey. Is there anything that I didn't ask you, which, which, which you'd like to address or, or just anything at all? No, I think we've really covered the ground. And so I really appreciate your having assimilated the study as deeply as you clearly have. And I think we've done a pretty good job lifting up the headlines. Uh, of course, there's a lot more there. Uh, so I would encourage anybody whose curiosity is piqued uh, to uh, go to uh, spiritualitystudy.org. It's a wonderful website uh, that uh, opens up the study in a very interactive way. In fact, you might enjoy going there first before you uh, uh, try to read the, uh, the, the, the study as a whole. Uh, 
Uh, but there is a lot there. Yeah, and I'd be remiss to mention you, you, you're also you, your site that talks about a lot of the research you've done. It's fester.org. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, so let me just say a little bit about the Sacred Inclusion Network, and then I'll sort of formally say goodbye to you, Bob. Um, people that want to know more about us, the simplest way is to go to our website. Um, we have a monthly online community exploration, which you could find out about by going to our site and looking under events. Um, and uh, if you want to support this, support our work, um, you could give us to us on Patreon, um, which is a way to support our podcasts and uh, explorations like this. And I'm going to put in the show notes some information about Fetzer and what we discussed um, during this call. And um, I just want to, again, thank you, Bob, uh, for, for, for coming on and being my guest. And uh, I hope people will, will um, take some time to review this very rich uh, study. It was very, very rich data about spirituality in America. Well, Angelo, uh, thanks for the invitation. And thanks even more for the great work the network is doing. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad we are now in relationship and let's continue.